Good morning, everyone. Take your Bibles and join me in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Hopefully you have picked up the notes and have a pen. I'm ready to dive into the text, the Word of God. And as you are making everything ready, I do want to thank you for your kindness at my absence last week. Uh, I had an uncle who passed away, and um, my aunt was uh, certainly a steady, constant Christian influence in the early days of my life when I was not a Christian. And uh, so, of course, when she asked me to come and do uh, my uncle's funeral, I certainly did not want to tell her no. And so I appreciate your kindness. appreciate Pastor Ed filling in and um, at, with really, very short notice. And I know uh, edifying time for all of you as you studied Mark chapter 4. But we turn our attention back to 1 Corinthians, a church which is an immature church. Paul laments that he is desiring to give them food, give them meat, but they are still only able to take milk. And so it's very much a letter that's corrective. It's correcting them in many of the errors in their understanding of the things of God and many of their errors in their practices. And we've come to chapter 12 and 13 and 14 where he's turning his attention to the exercise of spiritual gifts. And I want to just quickly remind you of what we've already learned about spiritual gifts. And we learned some important lessons about them in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And we learned some pretty important lessons about them in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So let's just review very quickly uh, some of the key things that he discussed when he introduced a proper understanding of what we mean when we say spiritual gifts. And I just want to remind you, when we're talking about spiritual gifts, we're talking about that, those gifts which allow you you as a Christian, to spur on others to godliness. They are gifts that allow you to advance God's work. Yes, you may have skills that are pretty important and necessary for the upkeep of a building. You may have skills that are necessary to keep our plumbing working. And while we are all very appreciative of that, it's important to know that a spiritual gift it's a gift about godliness that increases, pushes us on to righteousness, pushes us on to that which is good and noble and virtuous. So the first thing we learn in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, just take a look at that chapter. It's only two chapters back. Let's look at verse 3. The first thing that we learn at the end of that verse was, look at the last few words of chapter 12, verse 3. This is our first lesson. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Only Christians receive spiritual gifts. These are gifts for the redeemed. Those who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Christians have these gifts. Number two, look at verse seven. But to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for what? The common good. They are for the common good. That is what they exist for. In other words, your gift was not given for your benefit. Your gift was given for the benefit of everybody else. That's why you were gifted. To help, to help others and push them on and spur them on to godliness. Number three, look at verse 11. I'm still in chapter 12. Third thing we learned was, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. What's the third thing we learned? That these gifts are given according to God's spirit. God gives the gifts. And God gives these gifts according to his good will, his wisdom, when and where they are needed. Number four, look at verse 12. 
For even as the body is one and yet has many members, meaning I have a head and a hands and feet and a nose and ears. So even as the body is one and yet has many members and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. So what do we learn? Number four, gifts unify us. They bring us together. They are not meant to be divisive. They are meant to unify us. They bring us together. And then finally, then the last thing we learned that was pretty important from chapter 12. Each gift is needful. (laughs) Your gift is needed. Look at verse 21 and 22. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. Whatever your gift is, however the Holy Spirit has empowered you to spur others on to godliness and advance the cause of Christ, we need it. We need you. Well, it didn't stop there. The lessons continued in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But I do want to make one quick step. I, you know, the, the chapter divisions are arbitrary. They were added years later. The, the chapter divisions are not inspired by the Holy Spirit. The verse numbers you see in your Bible are not inspired by the Holy Spirit. Those were added later by humans as a, just as a helpful thing to, to help us get to where we need to be. So really, the end of chapter 12 really springboards us into 13. So the thing that we need to know that was really important as we head into chapter 13 is the gifts must be properly prioritized. There's a proper priority to the gifts. Look at chapter 12, verse 28. And God has appointed in the church first. So he kind of gives a he kind of gives a ranking here. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. Then and then he doesn't rank them anymore. He just kind of throws in a, a, a kind of a representative uh, collection of the gifts, then miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, administrations, and various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have the gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts, it says at the beginning of verse 31. So there's a priority to this. So number two, desire the greater gifts. That's verse 31. Desire the greater gifts. That's the second thing we learned from chapter 13 as we head into it. Of course, the the, the third thing we learned was maybe the most important. You use these in a loving way. You use these gifts to love others. Look at verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, even if it was possible, this is, he's exaggerating here, even if it was possible for me to learn every single language on the planet, which is not humanly possible, that's not a thing anybody can do. Even if I could do that, if I did not use that gift in a loving way, it would be of no purpose no value so number three you do it with love and then number four uh the gifts are going to achieve their purpose and then they're going to cease the gifts are going to achieve achieve their purpose and then they are going to cease verse four excuse me uh, verse eight of chapter 13 love never fails but if there are gifts of prophecy they will be done away if there are tongues they will cease If there is knowledge, it will be done away. Why? Because these gifts are going to achieve their purpose and then they will stop. But love will continue. And that brings us to chapter 14. Now, chapter 14 is going to be very practical and focus on a problem the Corinthians are having with one particular gift. They're kind of obsessed about one particular gift. And that is the gift of tongues. Now, I'd like to begin by just reading the first few verses of chapter 14. And then we need to stop and we need to define some terms. 
So let me just read. I'll probably read through verse 6. Paul says this, Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. See, there's that priority. So desire the, 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 the higher gifts, the gifts that do the, the work to the common good the most. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. But one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may receive edifying. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or of knowledge or of prophecy or of teaching? Now, interestingly enough, we have got to define what the word tongue means. Glossa. And what is strange about having to do this, and I think it's super unnecessary that we have to do this, but we have to do this. Because you should be aware that debate rages about what it means in chapters 12, 13, and 14 of 1 Corinthians. There's no debate anywhere else in the Bible. Every other place in the Bible where the word glossa is used, you get that's where we get the word glossary, right? You know what a glossary is. It's kind of a list of terms with definitions. In every single other text throughout the entire scripture, there is no debate. It's either referring to your actual tongue with which you speak, or it's a metaphor for either a language or a metaphor for a confessional statement. What you have confessed with your tongue. It's one of those two things. And everywhere else it is used in Scripture, there is no debate about what it means. It's so, it's so crystal clear from the context what it means. And then we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, and quite frankly, everyone kind of goes crazy. Now, I can tell you as a Bible teacher, there's a pretty, pretty important method about how you handle where you when you come to a word that's kind of obscure and you think it's unclear and there's a debate and there's debate about its meaning let the clear let what is clear about that word define what is unclear let what is crystal clear and unambiguous and understood to shine light on what is sadly been unnecessarily clouded now, Paul uses this term glossa 21 times in chapter 12, 13, and 14. He only uses this word three other times in all of his other letters. Glossa. And every time he uses it, it is either referring to your actual tongue in your mouth, or it's referring to a language or a stated confession. And I think it's worth just taking a look at them. Two of them are in Romans. One of them's in Philippians. So let's go to Romans first. Sorry that we're going to have to take this little diversion today. I think in so many ways, it's, it's probably not a necessary diversion. It's a necessary diversion because there's been so much confusion, but it's such a necessary confusion. And let's go to Romans chapter 3. And then we'll go to Romans chapter 14. These are two of the other three times he uses this word. And I think you'll agree when we read it that there's little or no confusion about what it means. He's quoting in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 13. He is quoting from Psalm 5. And this is what he writes. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they keep deceiving. Any doubt about what that's meaning? It's talking about their tongue. They're speaking. They're speaking deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. He uses it again in Romans 14. Romans 14, 11. 
And once again, he's quoting from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 45. And here's what he says in Romans 14, 11. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. Once again, referring to the tongue in our mouth that makes it possible for us to speak. We have to have a tongue to speak because it interrupts the air. It narrows the air. It, it makes the 44... No Humans can make 44 different sounds. And we put those in certain order. They make words. And that has meaning. And this is about a known meaning. He's saying every tongue shall give praise to God. It will not be an unknown thing. It will be clearly understood. And finally, he uses it again in Philippians 2.11. I'm not going to turn there because he's actually saying the exact same thing he's saying here in Romans 14. He says, every, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. So in every other time he uses it, it just means our tongue or it means, or it means a statement. A statement that Jesus is Lord. It's not used a whole lot in the New Testament. Mark uses it in chapter 7. James uses it in chapter 3. Uh, Revelation uses it in chapter 16 to refer to our physical tongue. Remember James says something along the lines, a tongue is a small thing, but it can start a great fire, right? Talking about if you run your mouth and you spread gossip and you spread rumors, you can cause a lot of trouble with something as small as your tongue. But most of the time, and in huge chunks, it's referring to a known language. A language that was spoken by a people group. At the Tower of Babel, God spread humanity all over the earth. He confused them with different languages. He did that as a punishment for their pride. And those languages exist literally all over the world in dialects, too, almost too many to number. And it's always referring to a known language. Probably most famously, we see it in Acts chapter 2. Go with me to Acts chapter 2. Here we see the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has fallen on the disciples, and Peter is preaching the first Christian sermon. This is a pretty important chapter. I want you to listen to who the audience is. So the Holy Spirit falls in that, comes upon them early in that chapter, and it causes a great noise, and it gathers a crowd. The Holy Spirit gathers Peter an audience. Verse 5. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were bewildered, because they were each one hearing them speak in his own language. Now that's miraculous. And they were amazed and marveled, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that each one of them here in our own language to which we were born? Again, this word glossa being language. And we get a list of the languages. Parthians, verse 9. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Pergia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and visiting from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues. Those are actual known languages. Speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And if you turn to the book of Revelation, where this word glossa is used, let me count here. I've got them all written down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. I may not go through all seven, but just to make the point, let's go through about four of them. Revelation chapter five, verse nine. Over and over again, glossa, tongue, is referring to a known language. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy art thou to take the book and to break its seals, for thou wast slain and didst purchase for God with thy blood men from every tribe and tongue 
and people and nation. Why would that be necessary? Why do you need tribe, people, and nation? Doesn't that cover it? Well, some people were probably known solely for the language they spoke. May not have been known for a particular area where they lived or the particular tribe they were part of. They would have been known because of their tongue, their language. That's how they were known. Go to chapter 7. Verse 9. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues. There it is again. Go to chapter 10, verse 11. I think it's chapter 10. Yeah, chapter 10, verse 11. And they said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues. Again, known languages and kings. And this goes on in chapter 11 and chapter 13 and chapter 14 and chapter 17. So what's why the controversy? Well, sadly, this is true today, and it's been true at several times in Christian history. There have been large swaths of probably influential and sometimes very uh, vocal Christians that this in chapter 13 of Corinthians and chapter 12 and chapter 14 is not referring to a language that anybody would know. It's referring to something that might best be described as an ecstatic utterance. And those who defend this will point to the pagan practices of the day. And they are correct. This was a pagan practice. It was a pagan practice to work oneself up into a lather and to usually under the influence of some type of drugs or some type of alcohol or just working yourself up into an emotional state until you just blabbered. And it was done by Sibylla in Virgil's Aeneid, where she was one of the ten female prophetesses in that poem. The Oracle of Delphi did it through Pythia, where she would often take some type of drug until she was just mumbling nonsense. And of course, that was always held out. Oh, those are the gods speaking. No, that's the morphine speaking. The Mayanids of Dionysus would speak this secret, unknown, unintelligible language. And it looks a little bit probably like what we saw with Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Remember how that went? They had a challenge on Mount Carmel where they were going to take an ox and they were both going to sacrifice it to the, 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 to the god of Baal and Elijah to the true God. And so the, they were going to try to call down fire from heaven, and he let the pagans go first. And they began chanting, and it didn't happen. And so at noon, Elijah suggested that maybe their gods were asleep. And so they began, it says they leapt around. It's, uh, pagans are very performance-oriented worship. So they leapt around so that the gods would be pleasing with, pleased with their performance. And they got louder and louder, and they would cut themselves. It said, Elijah says, they cut themselves until the blood flowed. All working themselves up into an emotional lather. Sadly, the exact opposite of what God tells us, isn't it? God tells us in, in Psalm 46, stand still and know that I am God. Exodus 14, 13, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. We are told to be sober-minded. We're not told to work ourselves up into a lather, an emotionally, an emotional trance, as if that's somehow more spiritual. You're somehow closer to God. It's the exact opposite, isn't it? 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober-minded. Peter says again in verse, chapter 4, verse, be sober-minded and self-controlled for the sake of your prayers. Your prayers are not supposed to be an emotional outpouring that is out of control. They may be emotional, but they don't have to be out of control. 1 Peter 1.13, prepare your minds for action. How? By being sober-minded. 
Titus, live self-controlled. First Timothy, to the elders, be sober-minded and self-controlled. To the deacons, you can't be addicted to much wine and be a, de a deacon. And your wives must be sober-minded. Older men must be sober-minded, Titus tells us. Younger men must be self-controlled, Titus tells us. Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk. First Thessalonians 5.6, be sober. Second Timothy, God gives us a spirit of self-control. Romans 12.3, Think with sober judgment. 1 Corinthians 15, which we'll get to in a few weeks. Wake up from your drunken stupor. 2 Timothy, always be sober-minded. Always means always, by the way. 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, let us be sober. This is the exact opposite of what we see going on at Mount Carmel with the pagans slashing themselves and jumping around and shouting. And it certainly is the exact opposite of what we saw going on in the first century AD with Sibylla and Pythia at the Oracle of Delphi and at the Carnival of Dionysus. So why the confusion? Well, shortly... Well, at the beginning of, it's, it's really been three stages in, in Christian history where this has been practiced. Really the first big division, they call them schisms. The first big schism in Christian history came in 172 AD. So not long after John, John's the last disciple, the last apostle to die. So not long after John's death, and by long I mean in relative terms, he dies at the very end of the first century A.D., and so this is well into the second century A.D. There was a man by the name of Montanus, and he founded a group called the Montanus, and they were from Pergia, which is in the region of what you and I today would think of as a, a Turkey, but, but then they called it Asia Minor, and it was a seat of very sensuous, mystic, dreamy, nature, pagan religions. And so he comes out of that, and he founds what he called a prophetic movement, and he had been a priest of Sibylla. So he had been part of these excited utterances. He had been part of these worship where you worked yourself up until you had lost control and you were just blabbering. And he brought with him two women, prophetesses, he called them. One is named Priscilla, not the same Priscilla in the book of Acts, and Maximilla. And they all used ecstatic utterances. And they proclaimed a new prophecy. And they claimed that, they claimed, they claimed that Christ would return to the small village of Pergia called Papuza. I'm probably mispronouncing this, but it looks like Papuza. And the new Jerusalem would be established there. But here's what they taught. Their, their, their focus was on the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to the exclusion and neglect of Christ and God the Father. And they, they really put all their eggs in that basket. The Holy Spirit is, is, is all. And in this new prophecy, they claimed, they prophesied in the first person. If they said it's like when we speak, it's like scripture is being written as we speak. Notice all the prophets in the Old Testament spoke in the third person. Thus saith the Lord. That's third person. These Montanists, first person. I'm, when I speak, it's like I'm a tool. It's like I'm an instrument that the Holy Spirit is playing. And so they delivered these utterances of what they called the paraclete, which means helper, the, the comforter, the Holy Spirit comforter. And they were, they were not even in possession of their faculties. It's like their eyes rolling into the back of their heads. And they would say these things and everybody would say, oh, how profound. And they would fall into these almost comatose ecstasies, probably almost certainly drug-induced. And they kind of forced the continuance of this. In fact, they said that to prove that you were a Christian, to prove that you were saved, you had to speak in these excited utterances. If you didn't speak in these excited utterances, you weren't going to heaven. And sadly, even theologians along the lines of Tertullian fell into this trap. But interestingly enough, that didn't last very long because by the third century AD, Chrysostomum is writing that this speaking in excited utterances had ceased among all the sects. In other words, he said, yeah, that didn't last very long and it died out. That's why when you read through the Middle Ages, 
the writings of August, Augustine and Martin Luther and even some people like Anselm and Aquinas and Melanchthon and Calvin and Beza and Zwingli, none of them talk about speaking in tongues. These excited utterances weren't happening. Then in the 1700s, they make a, sadly, they make a resurgence in the Quakers. In England, the Quakers, a sect of the Quakers who later became known as the Shaking Quakers, and they're called Shakers. I'm trying to, I'm trying not to smile. Led by a woman named Anne Lee, and she characterized these ecstatic utterances as worship. Now, they had a vision of rabid millennialism, this millennial reign of Christ. In fact, they set up villages that they called millennialist villages, where the only laws you could have were the laws of Moses. There was no council with any power to pass any laws. They were just going to follow the laws of the Bible. It did not matter that Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. They were going to make Jesus' kingdom of this world. And they would institute these dancing and shaking and falling on the ground and rolling around. They talked about how they would put these hoops. <laughs> they would make their clothes look like they were filled with, with the wind of the Holy Spirit. And they would shake and shout until England threw them out of the country. And you know where they came? Through, I'll give you one guess. The United States. Well, it wasn't the United States then came to America. And we, unfortunately, have been the great bastion of this idea of excited utterances ever since. We're, we're ground zero for this. And we are spreading it around the world to the point that there are African pastors who are saying, will you please stop sending us your missionaries because they come spreading this heresy about these excited utterances nonsense. And so sadly, we had to have this conversation because we can't talk about what tongues are until we talk about what they are not. <laughs> and I would suggest to you that chapter 14 is, is a simple chapter. It really is a simple chapter. Paul is saying, you know, if you're, if you're speaking a language that no one understands, you are doing nothing to edify the body and you are doing nothing to comfort the body, and it is a colossal waste of everyone's time. That is the message of chapter 14. He's going to tell them, when I came to you, I spoke in words you all understood. You should speak in words that you all understand. And so he's going to have to give them very specific instructions about how to handle this. I just want to read to you. I'd like to read the Bible to you. This is scripture. As John wrote it, in arcane, in halagas, kai halagas, in proston theon, kai theos, in halagas, autus in hain arcane proston theon. Was that particularly helpful to you? No. You know why? Because you don't speak Koine Greek. Pastor Ed, could you translate that for him? In the beginning? No, in the beginning, what, what is it, Ed? In arcane, in the beginning, in as laga, in a lagas, was the word, and the word ha lagas hein pros was from kantheon, kaitheos in halagas. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It's much better for you when I say it in English, isn't it? No. <laughs> Would you like me to keep reading from John chapter 1? <laughs> yeah, I think, this is, I think this is the bigger point. And so we're going to look at his, several of his corrections. I've got an A, B, C, D, and E. We're just going to look quickly at these corrections because they're very straightforward. And I, I, wish, I wish I had a time machine that would allow me to go back in time and watch a, first, a gathering of these Corinthians to see what's going on. But it appears that what is going on from the way Paul is addressing this with them is that there are individuals who probably speak other languages, they know other tongues, and they are interrupting to speak that. And when there's nobody else in the room who speaks that language but them, it's really not edifying to the body. 
And so they need to not interrupt what's going on. They need to pursue, quit elevating tongues above, above all things and instead pursue prophecy. So the first correction is they, they, they need to have the right priority. Correction number one is let's have the right priority, prophecy. Let's prophesy because that is useful to everyone. If there was someone here who spoke uh, Romanian, it would only be useful to them if someone got up and spoke Romanian. Let's do this. But the prophecy that is good for the most is what he wants them to pursue. So he says, pursue love. And was love one another. He said, how? Yet desire. I'm in verse one. Yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. There's the there's the priority. They put tongues in a much higher position than it deserves. It needs to be put back down where it belongs for the times when it is needed. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Yeah, if you're speaking Romanian and no one in the room knows Romanian, only God knows what you're saying. For no one understands, but in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. Yeah, you can talk about the mysteries of God all you want. But if you're speaking in a language that no one knows, I can continue reading Koine Greek, mysteries of God. But if you don't know Koine Greek, I think Pastor Ed would get a lot out of it because he knows Greek better than I do. But it would not be edifying to the body. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, it says in verse 2. Verse 3, but one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. And there, and that is important. That's an important part of this. Do it for the good of the whole. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But one who prophesies edifies the church. Now, I wish that you all spoke in tongues. Yeah, that's a pretty important gift, isn't it? He doesn't think this is a gift that's not necessary. To spread the gospel, it is necessary for people to learn other languages. And listen, some people are just masters at it. There are people that I, I you know, they, most of them probably work for the CIA. <laughs> they can pick up a language in no time flat. If you know French and then you go into Romania, which is a very Latinized. Listen, how Latinized is the Romanian language? They have Roman in the name of their country. Romania. It's a very Latin. They can pick it up like that. I'm going to share with you. I don't really have that gift. After two years of Spanish in high school and two years of Spanish in college, I'm happy to report that I can count pretty well in Spanish. But listen, I'm thankful that people have this ability. Uh, if you got our latest report from the Douglases, Trevor, Tre they talked about how Trevor was flying in a long flight and the seat was open next to him. He had all his books out. He was literally translating a dictionary. He was at the letter J, they said, translating a dictionary into an, an, an obscure Filipino dialect. <laughs> said, man, I'm glad there are people who can do this well. I'm glad there are people who have this gift. It's not unimportant for the spreading of the gospel. But for a bunch of Corinthians who all speak Greek, who are in one place and they're all speaking Greek, it's probably not a, a gift that needs to be put high on the shelf. But one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. Verse 5, now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may receive edifying. He said, don't lose sight of what the priority here is. It's not the speaking in tongues that is a thing. It's communicating the gospel that is the thing. And if you're just babbling, you're not communicating the gospel. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what shall I profit you? unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or of knowledge or of prophecy or of teaching. He says, listen, I don't come to you speaking in words you don't understand. I come to you to speak in terms you can't understand. So that's the first correction. Correction A is they, they, they have the wrong priority and they need to correct that quickly. B, they need to edify the common good. And that really is just this next part. It's, it's like, stop speaking into thin air. If people do not know what you are saying, you cannot help them. You are wasting their time and you are just, listen, me reading this Greek is a chance for me to show off and it's a chance for Ed to show off because he can translate it. It's not particularly edifying. Listen, 
Verse 7, yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp and producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? For if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? In other words, if people don't, if, I bet if there, was a, if there was a military call on the bugle, there are men in this room, I bet Mr. Newmeyer, I bet Mr. Zort would know what it means. The rest of us wouldn't know what it means. If it was a call to battle, I, I wouldn't know. I would need them to tell me <laughs> that's a call to battle. So also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. You know what's remarkable? And I just think this is kind of funny. The sects of Christianity that still persist in this speaking and excited utterances, they claim chapter 14 is kind of their ground zero for why they do it. I said, Paul says you're just speaking in the thin air. Verse 10, there are perhaps a great many kinds of languages in the world and no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be to the one who speaks a barbarian, and the one who speaks will be a barbarian to me. Yeah, can you imagine if I showed up on the shores of a, of a, of a, a you know, a, the, some of our, some of my uh, Filipino friends, won't name names, said, <laughs> tell me that their villages have, in the Philippines have very distinct languages that are completely different. I'm sure if they spoke to me or I spoke to them, we would sound like babbling barbarians to each other. Verse 12, so also you, since you are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Therefore, therefore, let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. This is pretty important. It's pretty important. Let's stop here and look at the third correction. You need to pray so that people can understand you. <laughs> you know, it seems almost funny that Paul has to say this. If you're going to preach Christ and Him crucified, people have to know that you're preaching Christ and Him crucified. If you're going to pray earnestly, this is the third correction. Pray that people can understand you. And that's what's going on in verses 13, 14, and 15. Therefore, if you're going to speak in tongues, pray that someone may interpret so they'll know what you just said. For if I pray in a tongue, a language, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful, especially if no one else knows. What is the outcome then? I shall pray with the spirit and I shall pray with the mind also. I shall sing with the spirit and I shall sing with the mind also. You know what he's saying? He is saying that it's important that you know what's being said so you can ponder it and think upon it. Let's come to the next correction. Speak in a way that people can test what you're saying. You know, the Bible says to test the spirits. The only way you can test the spirits is if you understand the words I am saying. Look at verse 16. Verses 16, 17, 18, and 19. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how will the one who fills the place of the ungifted, that means novice, by the way. I don't know what your translation says, but these would be novice, maybe the immature, the novice, say the amen at your giving of thanks since he does not know what you are saying. You know how sometimes, sometimes occasionally someone will say an amen to something the preacher said. How do you know whether you should say that is true and say amen, that is true, if you have no idea what they're saying? You can't. You can't test the spirits. For you are giving thanks, verse 17, for you are giving thanks well enough. In other words, I might be speaking in Romanian and I may be saying Christ and him crucified well enough in Romanian. But the other man's not edified because he has no idea what I'm saying. It's clueless. I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. Yeah, and he had to. Think about all of his travels. Think about all the languages he encountered. <laughs> think about the, all of his missionary journeys. You can look at the maps in the back of your Bibles probably and see all of Paul's missionary journeys that take him up through Asia Minor, that take him up into Macedonia, that take him all throughout Greece. He's eventually going to find himself in Rome. Yeah, he said, yeah, I, I travel so much, I need to know all these languages in order to preach Christ and Him crucified. But you're just all in one city speaking the same language. <laughs> what in the world are you doing? Verse 19, however, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. 
I'd rather spit. I'd rather say five words. Christ, I'd rather say Christ and Him crucified. Four words in a language you know, than say ten thousand words in a language you don't know. That's of greater value. You won't know whether what I'm saying is legitimate unless I'm speaking in a language you understand. He's not forbidding them from speaking in tongues. But he is suggesting they put it on a too high, too high a plane. Finally, he kind of closes up by focusing on prophecy again. He says, listen, let's just remember the main thing here is prophecy. Brethren, do not be children in your thinking. Yet in evil be babes, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people. And even so, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. In other words, why do we need to know foreign languages? So that we can go and preach the gospel to them. But prophecy is for a sign not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. If therefore the whole church should assemble together and all speak in tongues and ungifted men or unbelievers enter, will they not say they are mad? Yeah, that's exactly what they're going to say. But if all prophecy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. In other words, when you preach the gospel clearly and in a language they can understand, their heart is revealed. You find out where they stand. Are they standing with Christ or against him? And so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. You know, it's, I just don't think this is a particularly difficult chapter. <laughs> it's pretty straightforward, man. Say what you mean and mean what you say and say the gospel clearly so that people will know what you are saying. Yes, we need the gift of tongues. We need the gift of languages because we have to go to the world. And because of the Tower of Babel and our sin at the Tower of Babel, we all speak different languages. He finally wraps this up. The few things about just general things about worship some of them have nothing to do with speaking in tongues. But he does give a few instructions about this. First thing he tells them about the speak. Number one, the first thing he tells them about general instructions, if you're going to have to, if you're going to have to use this gift of languages, two or three times tops is all you should interrupt the service with. Two or three times tops. He says, verse 26, what is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two or, all, or at, most, at the most three and each in turn and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. In other words, when the church is gathered for an edifying time of teaching, you can't interrupt it over and over again with someone who maybe doesn't know. You know, if we had someone visiting who doesn't know English well, and they might have a person sitting next to them that can interpret, and they're going, yeah, it's like maybe, maybe they know. don't disturb the whole group more than once or twice to clarify, two or three times to clarify something. After that, it needs to wait till afterwards. Same thing with the prophets, by the way. Apparently the prophets were out of control as well. <laughs> That's number two. So using this gift of languages only two or three times. Also, you can only have two or three teachers. In other words, you can't just hand the microphone around the room and let everybody say something that has something they want to say. You can't do that. Verse 29, and let two or three prophets speak and let the others pass judgment. But if a revelation is made to another who is seated, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all may be exhorted. And the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. In other words, you can't do this in a confusing way. Verse 33. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So that's his second thing. Yeah, you can't let just three, two, maybe three teachers tops, and then that's it. Let's keep it orderly and digestible. <laughs> Uh, number three, now women are not allowed to teach. Verse 34, let the women keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but
but let them subject, subject themselves just as the law also says. And if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. So the third thing is that the, the men are the teachers and the women do not speak in church. And then finally, number four, he basically says, follow my instructions. Was it from you that the word of God went forth? You know, he's asking him, did any of you Corinthians write scripture? The answer is no. Or has it come to you only? Are you the only church in the world? He said, listen to my instructions. Do what I say. If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. But if anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. In other words, if you don't, if you're not willing to obey Paul's teachings, you're not going to get to speak. Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak in tongues. In other words, he knows this group at Corinth. They'll swing the pendulum all the way to the other side. Remember what he said about marriage? He said, marriage is great. Marriage is a good thing. You should desire marriage. He says, but not everybody has to run out and get married. <laughs> He's kind of having, they're a little immature. So he says, look, I'm not saying there's not a place for this. I'm just saying you put it in too high of a place. But let all things be done properly and in an orderly manner. So here's the challenge for you and me. Maybe it's not around the gift of tongues, but we all have a spiritual gift. And we all should ask ourselves very seriously, how could it, it, you should examine your own heart. Am I neglecting my spiritual gift? Am I abusing my spiritual gift? Am I using it just to prop me up? Am I, am I like the pastor sitting up there and reading Greek because he just wants to show off? Or am I using it for edification? So a couple of things I want you to understand about your, your gift. Number one, this is a serious question you should ask yourself. How are you encouraging the church on to godliness? What are you doing to push others onto godliness? To encourage their righteousness? To help them along the way? To partner with them? And if the answer is right now you're not really doing anything, you have to correct that. Now, it's funny that all this conversation about spiritual gifts, Paul does not give us one bit of advice about how to find out what our spiritual gift is. I will give you the best advice that was ever given to me. Start serving in a multitude of ways and you will find it. You will find what God is blessing in you. You'll find it. But if you sit on the sidelines, if you come here every Sunday morning and you sit in that chair for an hour and a half and then you go home, you will never find it. And you will neglect your gift and you will answer to God for that. Number two, how are you encouraging the disciplines? And what are those disciplines? Now, A, prayer. What is your prayer like with yourself and others? Do you only pray at meals and you never pray again? B, what is your service? How? What is your service to the church? What, is, what would you put there as your service to the church that is edifying the, the body and pushing them onto godliness and advancing the cause of Christ? C, evangelism. How are you sharing the gospel of Christ and him crucified with others? And then finally, D, discipleship. How are you either being discipled or how are you discipling someone else? And if the answer, quite frankly, is I'm not doing any of those things, that too is cause for concern. So for the Corinthians, it was pretty simple, wasn't it? They had taken the gift of tongues and languages and put it in a place it did not need to be. And they needed to desire the greater gifts. So they, he gave them lots of ways to correct this. But for you, uh, that might be different. But desire the greater gifts and pursue them with all your might. So let's pray to that end. And then we will sing and be dismissed. But Lord, this is a challenging chapter, but a pretty clear one. These have been chapters that have made it clear that the believers in this room, those you have purchased with the blood of Christ, those who have been redeemed, have been gifted by the Holy Spirit to serve the church. Lord, help us to get excited about doing that. Convict us where we have neglected our gift. Forgive us where we have abused it. And we treat it only as a tool to prop ourselves up. 
to our vain glory. We'll serve as long as I'm in the spotlight. And if I'm not in the spotlight, I'm not going to serve. Forgive us for that type of abuse of our spiritual gifts. Lord, I would pray that you would grant to each one of us uh, an abiding hunger that we cannot escape and that we cannot outrun. That wants to find that gift, develop that gift, use that gift for the good of the body. Because each gift is from you. Each gift edifies the body and each gift is needful. And we will never, ever be the fellowship you want us to be until those gifts are being used. So Lord, we don't want to neglect them and we don't want to abuse them. We thank you for this guidance that you've given to the Corinthians that is guidance to us. So even before this day is out, help us to put those gifts to use, to encourage, to build up, and to comfort. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we are dismissed, we will sing uh, the Bible.